This is the third in a short series of lectures uh, given by Michael Ellis at his school in California on dealing with sharp or shy puppies. My, oh, I lived for five years in New York City uh, while my wife was going to school, and you live in an apartment in New York City, uh, and every time you step out, the elevator door opens for you to go down, you don't know what's going to be on the other side of the elevator. Like somebody else with a dog, a whole bunch of screaming kids, you have no idea. That thing's going to pop open right in your face, and a new thing's there every time, right? And so you get, you get ready to be prepared. I, have, I take food with me every time with the young dogs when they're going out. I'd stand back from the elevator door. I made fo a focus exercise at the elevator, and they'd stand there and look at me and get fed while everybody filed out of the elevator, and then we'd go in, and I'd just use training that way. And I'd stand, the elevator would come up and down, and I'd stand in, my, uh, uh, in the hallway, and I would do that for 10 different, ele that it would come up and down. I wouldn't even get on the elevator frequently. I'd just stand there and do focus on me in front of the elevator where people came and go in the elevator. So knowing that I was not gonna be able to control that environment completely, I just was super preemptive. I was ahead of it, ready for it, that kind of thing. If there was a crazy elevator full of three dogs, I took the next one, right? <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> and you just kind of worked your way uh, around that stuff and you got to be very good at anticipating surprises a little bit. You say like, you know what? I'm coming up on this corner, around the corner from the park. This is a busy corner. People would come around the corner. And I'd stop shy of the corner, do a little focus stuff, and then go approach the corner. So I kind of already had the dog with me as I approached some place where I didn't know what was gonna happen, that kind of stuff. And so at that time, at the time that I was there too, I happened to have a, a, a five-month-old puppy that wanted to bite everybody. So, um, so she, I mean, she would, be, like, you move too fast, she would bite you. You stared at her, she'd bite you. Like, a Malinois. <laughs> so <laughs> it's my best dog still ever. She's fantastic. But she was, she wanted to bite everything. So I never went anywhere without toys and food all the time. Like, she got a toy stuffed in her mouth every time we passed somebody on the sidewalk. She got food every time we went to the elevator, constantly, nonstop, 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 right? And, to, and now, to, as an older dog, like, people, I could walk her down Fifth Avenue in the middle of the day, and she'd just ignore everybody. She doesn't like people. She doesn't want anybody grabbing her, but she's going to pretend they're not there. They're just not on her radar at all. So, but she was an extreme case, too. They're, like, it's not, like... She was, it's not normal, like as intense as she was about that stuff and their behavior, so that's not, it's very extreme. And if I can make her okay in those circumstances, then you can make lots of dogs okay. The only thing that she had going for her, which really made the counter conditioning stuff easier, was she had immense amounts of drive. So she was crazy for a toy and crazy for food. So, so that the more motivated your dog is, the better counter conditioning works, right? So we talked about that a little bit. Like when we're talking about counter conditioning a dog and making changes in their personality and how they perceive the world, when you do that, the more motivated your dog, the bigger the changes you make. If your dog's like, eh, I could take a toy or leave a toy, eh, food, whatever, you know, they're a little, they're medium motivation dogs, then counter conditioning is much harder, right? Because you don't have anything to give them that they go, oh my God, that was good. And if you have something like that, you give that to them in relation to something that's making them uncomfortable and they get better and better and better about it. And that's the, the whole idea behind counter conditioning is that we can give the dog something valuable to them. Yeah, like uh, look at the world as like one big training opportunity when you're out with your puppy. It's huge. Like if you can go someplace and go up and down stairs, in and out of elevators, like tile floors are awesome, you know, different, just anything that looks different, that sounds different. So what I tend to do is divide um, socialization stuff uh, into uh, environmental and social components, right? So environmental tends to be things like that, the, uh, a slippery floor, uh, a place that goes from light to dark, um, uh, uh, something sticking up in the environment, loud noises, uh, moving walkways, things like that. Those are obviously environmental uh, stressors. And there are some dogs that are really nervous environmentally, like you couldn't get them to walk across a tile floor or would not go up or down stairs or anything like that, but they're super fine socially. Fine with dogs, fine with people, love them, all great. You get other dogs that are uh, solid environmentally, will climb over anything, go through anything, don't mind noises, don't mind changes in, in surfaces or any of that stuff, noise, anything, and they're, they don't, so they have social glitches. They don't like strange people or they don't like strange dogs, right? And you frequently get dogs that are one another, and some are nervous in both areas, right, which is great, right? <laughs> uh, but some are nervous in both areas. But I tend to, environmental stressors are much easier to work for because they don't do anything back. 
you can control the environmental stressor. It's not moving. It's where it is. I can work around it. I can work in proximity to it. There are surprising environmental stressors, but lots of them allows me to sort of work incrementally around those things to make them better. The social ones are harder because then you need the cooperation of the other being involved, whether it's a person or a dog. If you're interested in a dog training school, I would highly recommend Michael's School in California. Michael and I are doing a series of dog training DVDs, and if you're new to our newsletter, you can go to the streaming video section on my website and watch over 200 different streaming videos. <laughs>